Salam from the People's Dispatch Studios here in New Delhi. I'm Siddhant Ani and you're watching Daily Debrief. On the show today, Europe is making moves to impose a fourth round of sanctions on Iran. Turkey's president has announced when he wants to hold elections in the country and Latin American leaders uh, are meeting in Buenos Aires in an attempt to reinvigorate regional mechanisms for dialogue and cooperation. First up, the European Union foreign ministers are set to place a fourth round of sanctions on Iranian individuals as well as organizations. Uh, this comes days after the European Parliament members voted to put the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps on its terror list. The IRGC is a multi-service branch of the Iranian Armed Forces. Uh, it's expected that about three dozen individuals and organizations will be added to a growing list of those placed under sanctions. In a trilateral meeting on Saturday night, uh, the President of Iran, Ibrahim Raisi, uh, Parliament Speaker Mohammad Bakr uh, Kalibaf, and Judiciary Chief Ghulam Hussain uh, Mohseni J lambasted the European Parliament's hostile action against the IRGC. They said the move is another action in the hybrid war against the Iranian people and the Islamic Republic. This is according to reports coming in from Iranian media. Uh, Dr. Abdul Rahman covers the region for People's Dispatch and is with us in studio today to tell us more about the thought process behind what's happening in Europe. Uh, Abdul, Iran's response is obviously uh, in line with what we would expect. Uh, but but what is the conversation in Europe before first the European Parliament's uh, vote and then the sanctions that might follow? Well, uh, it seems that uh, if you see the voting pattern out of uh, around 530, most of them, I think around 500 people, 500 delegates voted in favor of the resolution, which was uh, uh, introduced as an amendment to the foreign policy report, last year's foreign policy report. So it seems that there is a by and large uh, consensus. consensus. A very small number of people, around 30, 40 people, abstained or uh, voted against the resolution. Uh, it seems, as uh, Iranians have claimed, that Europeans have forgot, forgot about their own foreign policy interest mm. and are uh, basically following what US is doing. Uh, we all know that US has already sanctioned IRGC in 2018 um, under the so-called maximum uh, pressure campaign. And uh, uh, Iranian, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the Europeans are now uh, in, in, a, in a kind of a in, a, in a, in a position or in a situation where they want to do whatever the US wants to do. We should see it in the context of what is happening in Ukraine and what has been the larger position of European Union when it comes to its policy vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the crisis in Ukraine. Mm. So uh, it seems on the similar pattern, since US had uh, sanctioned a particular set of countries, European Union will do the same. Despite the fact that European Union, uh, particularly Joseph Borrell, uh, during his, as it was reported in the media, during his conversation with uh, Iranian foreign minister, mm. uh, said that it seems that they were not very keen to, the individual countries, the member countries are not very keen to implementing the uh, IRGC sanctions mm. uh, or making it a terrorist organization. But uh, the fact that uh, European Parliament overwhelmingly accepted a resolution calling uh, IRGC a terrorist organization shows that uh, uh, that uh, the, there is hardly any uh, uh, space for the difference of opinion. It may be uh, that the individual countries uh, uh, choose not to uh, uh, follow what European Parliament has prescribed. Mm. Ultimately, it is uh, just an opinion. Yeah. It is uh, it has just a, re it's a resolution which has a, a, a value for rhetorical sense, mm. nothing beyond that. Mm. But um, given the larger uh, uh, pattern which we have seen in last few months, anything can happen. Right. Uh, this comes uh, soon after, as we've talked about, the, the pretty much the death of the, the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, it comes at a time when Iran is going through its own domestic issues, but also going through an economic crisis because of uh, sanctions that have been imposed uh, for several years. What impact will it have on regional stability as well as the country itself? It's, uh, it's very obvious, it seems. Iranians have made it very obvious. The foreign minister, Abdul, Abdullah Hyan, had said that if individual countries choose to uh, implement the uh, European Parliament's uh, resolution, it, would, it can mean anything. It can mean that Iran will leave uh, NPT as well. That is a very strong statement to make. Mm. Uh, Iran has been one of the original signatories of the 
nuclear non proliferation treaty and it has been one of the few countries despite the vilification carried out by uh, uh, us and other who has uh, adhered to the strict uh, monitoring uh, uh, protocol of the iaea he uh, he also said that if it happens he will expel all the uh, monitoring teams from iran mm. it, it means that the european union with this particular uh, uh, move has pushed iran to a wall and now iran has nothing uh, else to do S so far when the talks were going on on jcpo despite the fact that it is well known fact that it is almost dead mm. there was a scope that some day some day at least one part of the treaty uh, set of countries which were part of the original uh, jcpo are not openly hostile to iran they are ready to negotiate on certain issues mm. and they are initiating the dialogue the, uh, the talks in vienna were primarily mediated by these uh, european uh, uh, signatories yeah. but now that if the european signatories choose to take the similar position as us it means that it's a complete breakdown of any diplomatic uh, uh, um, efforts in the future in future and uh, it, of course it will have a very uh, uh, bad effect on uh, not only the larger uh, 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 non proliferation attempts uh, uh, disarmament attempts in the world yeah. uh, in the global politics but also on regional uh, uh, front as well all right thanks very much abdul we'll ask you to stick around because we're talking about turkey next and uh, want your inputs on that as well uh, Tur uh, in turkey of course the president has announced that may 14th is when the country's next parliamentary and presidential elections will take place President Recep Tayyip Erdogan, uh, who of course plans to seek re-election, made the announcement uh, on Saturday at a youth conference in the Bursa province. A video was released later on. Erdogan has been leading Turkey since 2003, first as Prime Minister and then since 2014 as President. He faces his toughest challenge in these two decades as the country deals with multiple challenges, uh, not the least of which is the economy. Uh, Abdul, we've been talking about Turkey and, and, and the elections and all the issues surrounding it. Uh, it's a NATO member nation mm -hmm. and, and at a very critical part uh, in the geography of the world. Uh, in terms of the timing of this announcement as well as the timing of the elections itself, any particular uh, political sort of trends that you uh, notice? Well, it is quite obvious the, the polls so far, whatever polls have been published are showing that Erdogan and AKP is on the, uh, uh, if it, the trend continues, they will be out of power. Right. There is a slight uh, advantage for the opposition. The opposition yet is not very clear about it. But if they are somehow able to garner uh, the support of uh, the third bloc, you can say the Kurdish, pro-Kurdish mm. leftist party, SDP, mm. if it comes to, uh, uh, in support of uh, what opposition has been able to do so far, they have formed a six-party coalition. And that looks very formidable, very strong on the ground. So if that continues, uh, 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 it seems that Erdogan has a very, uh, uh, chances are that he may lose. And that is the main reason uh, behind this advancement of the date. The original dates, uh, original uh, dates were in June for the, this election uh, and now it has been advanced by almost a month and it seems at a time when the opposition is still talking about a joint candidate hmm. against Erdogan and they have not been able to uh, 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 decide figure that. out who yeah. will be yeah. so in that particular context it gives advantage to uh, uh, Erdogan and his party hmm. because it is already in power it hmm. has already decided who the candidate will be yeah. and uh, it is already doing all the preparation required along with the state machinery which is uh, supporting it. So, in uh, it seems it is a very political decision uh, mm. taken and very uh, uh, sharp decision at this moment to kind of uh, 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 kind of keep the uh, opposition on the back foot. Mm. And uh, uh, also, uh, if you see, this is the time uh, Erdogan has chosen primarily also because uh, the, he has already announced whatever economic quote unquote corrective measures mm. his government could take. Mm. Uh, he has already uh, decided on some regional, crucial regional issues vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Syria or uh, uh, in Armenia, Azerbaijan and other places mm. where he had some, could have been some issues uh, uh, if it is delayed. So it seems that Erdogan has prepared his pitch 
and he wants to play on that. Fair enough. Uh, make, makes sense. Uh, from, uh, from, from a wider political angle, uh, the opposition parties, the six-party coalition you're talking about, as well as uh, the, the, the more left-leaning uh, side of things, uh, is there an alternative uh, that people are looking forward to in terms of at least some kind of relief from the economic hardship that Turkey is going through? Well, it is not very clear at this moment uh, uh, because the opposition has not been able to uh, decide, uh, put finger on who the candidate will be. If there is a can candidate, then it is uh, the chances of figuring out whether he or she will be able to uh, uh, contest or take, uh, give challenge to Erdogan or not, despite the fact that there are parties which have advantages. Mm. Uh, whether that will convert into that may convert into the parliamentary election that will create more seats for them, but uh, whether that will convert into the presidential election also that is one thing which is not clear. Mm. The mayor of uh, uh, Istanbul, uh, uh, who was persecuted uh, a few months back, w was the strongest candidate. Whether it, it is not clear yet whether he will be chosen as the candidate uh, of the joint opposition or not. Uh, given the fact that there is a legal uh, uh, case, there is a case against him, though that case does not bar him uh, mm -hmm. from contesting the election, but uh, nonetheless it can become an issue. Right. So uh, that is one part. The second thing is, uh, it is yet not clear whether HDP will support the six-party coalition. Uh, so far, they have said that they are going to contest independently. Own, yeah. They will have their own candidate and that may divide the votes of op opposition votes and that can create advantages for Erdogan mm -hmm. uh, in that sense. So, uh, it, there are many ifs and uh, buts uh, till the, the opposition decides mm. the stra its, its strategy and comes up. There is hardly any time left for them now. Mm. But, uh, uh, until that happens, it is difficult to predict uh, uh, what will be the uh, uh, overall situation. But if you see the larger political mood in Turkey, uh, and, and uh, as I said before, the polls also indicate that mm. mood, uh, particularly among the working classes, particularly among the middle and lower middle sections of the uh, Turkish population, mm. which had been the traditional voters of Erdogan and AKP, uh, for various reasons, for economic uh, um, uh, growth, which AKP had been able to achieve in the previous mm. terms, mm. Uh, also because of the uh, some Islamic uh, uh, tendencies, which has kind of created a popular uh, base for uh, AKP and its traditional base, right. consolidated the tra with the traditional base. Mm. Um, uh, that is that particular base is not with AKP completely this time Anymore. and that may be the decider. All right. Thanks very much, Abdul. Uh, of course, uh, sometime in March is when the formal announcement, formal announcement. of the dates yeah. will come out. So we'll ask you to, of course, track that for us. But thanks for your time today. And finally, on Jan 24th, Latin American leaders will participate in the seventh summit of the heads of state and government of the community of Latin American and Caribbean states known as CELAC. Uh, the event or the, the summit is taking place in the capital of Argentina, Buenos Aires. Presidents Luis Arce of Bolivia, Nicolas Maduro of Venezuela and Lula da Silva of Brazil have confirmed attendance, among others, including of course host Alberto Fernandez. The summit marks Brazil's return to the forum after parting ways under far-right former President Jair Bolsonaro. Uh, created in 2010, this mechanism of dialogue and cooperation was intended to replace the Cold War era Rio Group and provide a counterweight to US policy and interventions in the region. It's also a valuable forum for discussion and collective meetings between Latin American and Caribbean governments and those beyond the hemisphere, the likes of China, the European Union and maybe India even. Uh, Prashant Radhakrishnan is in studio now to talk more about the summit and what we can expect from it. Uh, Prashant, we mentioned already that Brazil is back in the fold. Uh, beyond that, what is the significance, or including that perhaps, what is the significance of the CELAC summit at this point? Right, so that's really important to note that CELAC as an organization was conceived of to present a very different vision from that of what the United States and its allies have traditionally been presenting. In fact, mm -hmm. it was founded by Hugo Chavez, who was one of the forefront, you know, who was one of the in the forefront of actually presenting that vision and actually making it a reality. So CELAC has always been a space, an alternative space, a different space, one which actually says that, hey, the rules that so far have tried to govern Latin America will not run, mm. right? And now it's true that CELAC took a bit of a hit 
over the past, uh, in, the, uh, in the second half of this decade, or that decade basically, when there was this whole right-wing uh, turn to power, many countries' right-wing governments came to power, for instance in Argentina, and we know it happened, we know it happened in Brazil, we know it happened mm. in many other countries. Mm. And it, it, you know, things, the CELAC as an organization took a bit of a hit. But then we've seen that over the past few years, there's been another turn, another so to way. speak. Now, mm. progressive governments, even radical governments coming to power in many of these countries yeah. are returning to power. And therefore, CELAC as a body has sort of become more strengthened, no doubts about it. Mm. And I think it, the, uh, so the continuation of this trend is what we see in Brazil's returning to and CELAC. Brazil has a historic role in this. Lula has a historic role in this. Mm. Lula, in fact, organized a conference in 2008 that was a precursor to the inaugural CELAC conference in 2011. Right? And uh, in 2020, Jair Bolsonaro withdrew from CELAC saying that it was supporting what is the usual rhetoric. Mm. It was supporting dictatorial regimes, which means countries like Cuba. So, mm. <laughs> you know, you can uh, guess the legitimacy of these arguments. Mm. So, Brazil's coming back to power. One of the first things Lula did after, we are, you know, assuming office, and that really shows that Brazil is very committed to this process of regional integration, but on different terms from what the United States suggests. And it's also important to note that, for instance, Nicolas Maduro of Venezuela is going to be attending that meeting. Yeah. It's a very important thing. Again, like I said, let's go back to 2018 and 19, mm -hmm. when Venezuela was surrounded by uh, you know hostile governments on all sides, which were attacking their revolutionary post process, the Bolivarian Revolution. And now things have changed to the extent that Ma Maduro has been invited. He's attending a CELAC meeting, which is a very good sign for regional integration. So all in all, I think it's a very positive moment, the fact that there are governments from across Latin America which are meeting, which have differences, of course, like of all course, governments have yeah, differences, yeah. but which are meeting, uh, you know, in a space of cooperation, in a space of harmony. The CELAC is not like the Lima Group, mm. which was set up by Canada, comprised all those right-wing governments at a time, and their sole purpose was to apply pressure on the Venezuelan right, government. Right, right. In this is a space of cooperation, of dialogue, etc. So that's a great thing. Nonetheless, also important to remember that this meeting is take place, taking place even as, on the one hand, we have the... <clears throat> Radical, uh, the reactionary response in Peru, mm. where, you know, uh, Pedro Castillo's right. overthrown this right-wing de facto regime of Dina Boluarte is in power, mm. suppressing people's protests, conducting massacres, for instance. Mm. On the other hand, we know that Bolivia, again, bordering Argentina, is facing its own crisis after the right-wing coup leader Camacho was arrested. There have been these violent uprisings. So, I think it's also important to note that even as there have been these governments coming, to, coming back to power, the, it's not that the right wing has been defeated or Absolutely. it's been vanquished, so to speak. Mm. It, the fact is that the right wing remains an ever-present threat. And it's something that these governments have to take note of. But in terms of economic possibilities, in terms of trade, in terms of building together a common vision for the mm. continent's future, mm. uh, all these are very you know important aspects that CELAC can play a role in. Mm. Also, equally important to understand that this is coming at a time when there's China has a greater role to play in that mm. continent. The governments and you know, how CELAC as a body will engage with them is really an important question to note. Mm. And uh, there's also a lot of hope that some of these countries together can pre present along with other countries in the global south a different way of how the world Absolutely. should be structured. Yeah. So keeping all that in mind, a very significant meeting as far as CELAC is concerned. You, you talked about uh, the economic and trade importance of uh, these kind of regional mechanisms. In that sense, Argentina uh, is a major economy that's going through some uh, significant turmoil. Uh, how important is it that Argentina are hosting? Uh, and then talk about the wider sort of beyond the hemisphere uh, implications of it. Right, Siddhan. So, uh, it's very important that Argentina is hosting it because uh, right now the government, of course, the right-wing critics of the government have already labelled this some kind of a conference of dictators, etc., mm. etc., because they're unhappy with Nicolas Maduro or Daniel Ortega or the representatives from Cuba participating. And they're, you know, raising a lot of hue and cry because the elections are scheduled to be held this year in Argentina. And that's a very important process. Mm. But I think for the government in Argentina, this is an important summit because it brings together all these uh, like I said, leaders from across the continent. It also, in some sense, is a positive reinforcement for the Alberto Fernandez government, which is facing a host of attacks. And we do see that in Argentina, there is the right wing attempting to come back in various ways, yeah. using, for instance, the process of lawfare in by which uh, Vice President Cristina was targeted, using, for instance, uh, attacks on uh, you know various aspects of the government. And also there's a large economic crisis, like you pointed out, a lot of which has to do with the kind of conditionalities the IMF has imposed. Mm -hmm. So there have been a lot of disagreements over there as well. So for Argentina is one of those countries in the midst of that kind of crisis. We've talked about other examples like Pakistan or Sri Lanka. Yeah. Argentina, of course, benefiting from 
having a very progressive government under President Alberto Fernandez. Uh, but nonetheless, the fact remains that even for a progressive government, even for a government which believes in alternatives, the global financial system is so skewed yeah. that it often leaves them with very little opportunities. Mm. So a lot of debate in the left, in the progressive sections in Argentina has been around this issue of how do we sort of build alternatives, how do we not give in to... Uh, you know, the conditionalities imposed by the IMF, for instance. A lot of people struggles also based on the same issues. Mm. So I think it's a key moment for Argentina because it's in the, in the run-up to the elections, these kind, of, uh, uh, these kind of, you know, meetings matter because they also come out with a vision. There'll also be a conference of people's moments, movements associated, you know, happening around the same time where they'll be talking about greater regional integration, greater right. cooperation between people's movements. That also is a very key moment. Mm. So, a uh, significant moment for Argentina, yeah. All right. Thanks very much for that. We also all the time we have as well. Uh, and with that, we bring this episode of The Daily Debrief to a close. From Prashant, myself and the entire team here at People's Dispatch, thank you very much for watching. As always, we invite you to head to our website, peoplesdispatch.org, for details on these stories and all of the other work we do. Don't forget also to follow us on the social media platform of your choice. We'll be back again tomorrow. See you then. Goodbye.